OK, good morning. I'm very sorry about the technical hitches there. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Phil Pearson. I run my own lift and escalator consultancy practice based in the West Midlands. And uh, I'm also the papers chair for the Sibsey West Midlands group. Uh, this morning's presentation is all about why I signed up as a chartered engineer. And I ask myself that every time I try and get the papers out to, to do some work on it. But it's um, as basically an explanation of why I'm doing it. It may, it may apply to yourself. We'll leave lots of time at the end for questions. Um, so I'll just run through why I signed up for it. And you may have some equivalent experiences or other issues you want to discuss. So what is a chartered engineer? We all know the term and you think you understand what the actual, uh, it's uh, like an internationally respected standard. What, what actually is it? It's basically a demonstration of competence. And OK, why do we need that? Why do we need to demonstrate our competence? You know, we know we're good. We work for a big consultancy practice or our own practice. But of course, the problem is that, uh, you know, that's great. But only you knew, only knew know that unless it's in the professional CV out. The chartered engineer is a demonstration of that because, it's, uh, because you go through the interview process, because you do the report, it's a proven thing. It's not just your words saying you're competent. It's an independent authority saying you're competent. So it's basically a demonstration of competence. And one of the main areas, or areas, not main areas, is the theoretical and practical problem solving with new technology. And why I'm saying these things is these are sort of things that need to be included in your chartered engineer um, if you're doing it the technical report route, which, which I am doing. Also, there needs to demonstrate the competence, the accountability for project finance, personnel management. Again, something, yeah, well, I've got a big team, I know this. You may know it, but again, this is all about being able to demonstrate your competence to independent people who don't know you. And, uh, you know, they take you pick your CV up and say, oh, that's very nice, that, but it could be a copy and paste of somebody else's. So it's that, that independent assessment of your abilities. It also shows you a set of skills to develop other staff, mentoring other staff, bringing younger engineers through. Um, so it's all again something that won't show on your professional CV, but it's something that is explored in the, the chartered engineer. And effective interpersonal skills in communicating technical matters. How many times have we been to meetings and you got the architect there? And all he wants to do is produce a building that's nice and shiny. It doesn't need to work particularly well. It needs to look good. And, um, you know, it's a matter of communicating what we need to achieve on the engineering side, uh, as opposed to what they're trying to do. And, and putting that into a simpler language or language that they understand. And so it's the, and it's just not just that, but it's also perhaps communicating with your own staff on the technical matters. So it's that business be able to demonstrate that. So what else does a chartered engineer do? It's a bridge to international qualification. Well, I'm not working internationally now. What do, need, what do I need that for? Because who knows what you're doing next year when you move practice and suddenly find your practice that's working in the Middle East or elsewhere. So it's based on, you may have heard of the International uh, Engineering Alliance, the Washington Accord. And again, that, that's as a registration of a competency standards, and it's a demonstration of competence. So you see how they're actually doing the CN ties into that with the demonstration of competence, and it's, it's one of the qualifications for becoming a, a chartered engineer. But it's only a part of the qualification because to register on the Washington Accord. There's further learning involved, so it's a stepping stone to that. So again, if you look, if you you may be considering international work, but it comes along and uh, you, know, you may have done, done international work already. Ability to meet client requirements, like walking walking on water and things like that. So uh, again, client requirements. Hospital authorised engineers must be a chartered engineer. You know, and how long? before that spreads into local authorities, because these people move around these same organisations. So the guy who's the chief engineer at the hospital one day, they move to a local authority and say, well, hang about, we're using this uh, consultant. 
but how do we know this guy's got, you know, we've actually, you know, got the abilities and experience. We have, need to introduce this. And, um, you know, so it's only a matter of time before that happens that the clients start to ask for a, a, a chart engineer. As part of the process, it may not be the guy doing the actual work himself, but it's somebody who can check the work has been done to make sure it's to an adequate standard. And it gives them that reassurance um, and you know, covers, covers their backside as well. So if something goes wrong, well, we had a chartered engineer on the job, you know, he, he would have put, so, he, he is our responsible per, person, you know, because so you can see there where, you know, it's not going to be a choice in the future to become a chartered engineer, it's going to become a necessity. Self-confidence, oh yeah, show me an engineer and I'll show you a self-confident guy who believes in what he's doing, but again, it's, you know, you might have confidence in your own abilities, but it's been able to demonstrate to people that you have that confidence. And again, just be able to put CN after your name on an email, on your business card, if you still use them. Um, immediately, it's a demonstration of your abilities. You know, it's, it's un unwritten. It's, it crosses a lot of ticks, a lot of boxes before you have the questions asked. Let's take an example to all the people in your organisation. You look around your organisations you work for and just look who's got a chart engineer and you know, see how well they've done. And you'll, you'll realise that they're not going to be the bottom tier of the organisation. They're going to be you know, in the middle towards the top of the organisation. So if you want to progress, I would suggest it's a, an essential part of being able to progress. So, OK, how is it difficult to achieve a chart engineer? The word of American presidents called JFK for the younger attendees. We chose to choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, because they are hard. And then they did it. They may have had 400,000 people working on the Apollo project, they may have cost many billions of dollars, but they did it. And as he said, why would we do it? In other words, if it's easy, everyone would do it. If a chart engineer was an easy thing to achieve, everybody in your organisation would have CN after the name. It's not easy. And don't kid yourself, it is. And um, you know, which again is why it's a qualification or a, a, a not qualification, a registration that is well worth having. And I'd say in the future it's going to be essential. So how can we do it? Two routes, uh, the bachelor's degree with honours, plus an appropriate accredited master's degree, or an engineering doctorate. Pretty tough that, that one, you know, and uh, unless you've been through the university route, you know, you will not be in a position probably for many years to get to that same position to go for a chartered engineer. The alternative, the experienced engineer, is a technical report route, which is the one I'm doing, which basically again is, is a demonstration of your competence, covering all those topics we, we mentioned in the earlier slide of management, the responsibilities, self-confidence, um, and it's it's a way of demonstrating your ability. So how do you do it? Find a sponsor and mentor. Again, that is something where somebody can help you or somebody in your own organisation. They need to be a chartered engineer at a minimum, um, and they need to know you well, you know, um, generally five to ten years of knowing you. You know, because they're, they're basically uh, vouching for your experience. So in other words, whatever you write down, they will probably have a knowledge of or be able to uh, critically assess it to, to uh, you know, understand it's got relevance to it. To the, um... Choose a subject. Again, massive area there. But when you choose a subject, it's going to be one that covers all those topics. So it can't just be a, a very technical pet sub project you've done, it has to include the communication with the client, it has to include the management of it, the team management. It's um, and, and once you've chosen your subject, that then goes to, um, oops, that's back a bit, a bit quick there. Yeah, it's your subject. That then goes to headquarters to have an assessment of whether it's going to be suitable. So you've got to get past your, um, your mentor first, they got to say yes, that's a subject that's suitable, uh, and then the entire quarters to say yes, they'll accept it as a suitable subject. 
my particular subject is a rigid chain technology and that's the underside of a 40 ton truck lift in Manchester. The chains that you can see there, the vertical base is what suspends, or not suspends, supports the lift. The lift is above your head there and the bottom there you can see the drive shafts of the equipment on the um, where the chains go into as a cassette. It's the largest chain lift or rigid chain technology installation in the UK and probably Europe at the moment on the lorry lifts. And there are bigger ones elsewhere in the Middle East and Far East. And there's two of them. So this 40 ton truck lift is mirrored by the one to the left hand side of it. So that's what that's my topic. I've been involved that for four years, uh, taking it from in, inception right the way through to we're doing the final commissioning at the moment. You know, so it, you can see that it's a, a complex job, a big team involved. It's a part of a theatre complex, um, working with the main contractor, architect. Actually, I'm working for the main, the main client, the uh, city council. You know, so it's, it covers all the areas. So you've got to write an abstract, about 150 words. And again, the abstract is four sections which cover the areas I mentioned before. So in your abstract, you're demonstrating to SIBSI and the assessors that you're covering those areas. So choosing subjects is very critical and, and make sure it does cover those four areas. Um, and once you've done that, that's the easy bit. You know, once you've got the approval from SIBSI to get forward on it, you can get crack on it now. Go on, lad, get working on it. You're doing then between seven and 10,000 words of a technical report. And uh, as uh, JFK said, if it was easy, you know, if we do it because it's hard, and it is hard. You know, it's, um, it may sound a lot of words, but you can soon use them up. Um, I'm at about five and a half thousand at the moment, and um, it, it's quite a challenge. Uh, again, because you're going to cover all those four areas, but keep on track of what you're trying to, uh, to your, your core subject is. And then you get, when you do all that, and your mentors accepted it, uh, again, because they, they were working with you through this process, so it's so important to get the right mentor. Uh, then you go for the technical interview in Ballum, in headquarters in London, um, where you'll be interviewed by at least two people who will go through your technical report and ask you lots of questions on it. So I'm looking forward to that, because the topic I've been involved with for four years, I know back to front. It's, um, it's And it's, again, it's that business again, having self confidence and understanding that the subject you choose is one you will be able to uh, actually answer all those questions on. All the because remember, these guys are highly experienced engineers, they're not just go somebody off the street, so they're going to ask you some probing questions. When I did my uh, membership interviews, a similar, similar process, but that was only about 5,000 words, and there again, they were asking a lot of questions on how things work on how why did you do that what was that why do you make that decision you know how did you involve this how did how was this um, put together so it's um quite a bit so as i say i'm presently advising the present item report big challenge is actually finding the time to do it as party as well as your day job you spend all day doing reports and stuff on site the last thing you want to do is sit down at night get the laptop out and think what was I doing last time I opened this document? Um, and that's half the challenge. It's like if you're doing a report in your normal day job, if you're picking it up every two or three days, it's difficult to report. Not more, it's more difficult to report than if you just push on through it one session. Again, that might be the way around it. That's, that's something I may have to consider. It's just taking a, a week out from the business and just that's it. It's my project. Because at the moment, it's taking me 12 months. I'm still, you know, not there. So I say, find subject to match the report criteria is very important. A big huge thank to, to my sponsor, my mentor, Dr. Gina Barney, very patient lady. She was, uh, she was my sponsor for my membership, and uh, backed on that, she was uh, my sponsor for this charter engineer. So that's my journey. And if there's going to be questions, I'll put your hand up or shout out over the microphone. There's class of questions of the, the attendees. And Gavin, be, what's your involvement on the, 
uh, chart engineer process? Um, I've been at MSIBS for um, quite a few years. Um, and I was contemplating do a go for FSIBS, which I'm told I'd get or do a go for CN or do do both. Um, so I'm, it's getting a bit more information, just deciding what to do. Yeah, the, the fellowships one I'm looking at actually. Although I look at that, I think, well, let's get me to start engineer done first, <laughs> one step at a time. But I understand that these actually is a quite straightforward. If you've got your MSIBS, to go for the charter is like a thousand word uh, report, so it, it's actually it's, it's quite doable compared with the charts engineer. Yeah. So if you were thinking of that, I'll, I'll suggest do your, your fellow bit first, yeah. and then you know get that because it's 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 easier to it's easier to achieve. It is easier to achieve compared with the charts engineer. At least um, it gets you back into the routine of doing the the technical report writing bit. Um, obviously, it's only a thousand words. And if you've been a, a member for how many years now? Uh, since about 2004, there's oh, MCBS. Right. Um, so you've got, you got, you got a lot of experience then. And did my MBA at Warwick University um, about 2007 to 12. Um, so got MBA as well as MCBS, right. MIE. Yeah. So it's, yeah. What do I do? What's my next step? Yeah, I would most suggest to do, do, do your fellowship bit first. Mm -hmm. I say that's something that's it's very straightforward. And in fact, we are going to organise for West Midlands uh, an event on you doing the fellow aspect of the um, the membership. So I hope that's been a, a assistance. If you, if you want to contact me to have a, a chat, um, my information's uh, well, was on was on the screen. Uh, but feel free to give me a drop an email.